Hello, I'm Jean Meserve, and welcome to another episode of Reimagining American Democracy. This series brings together elected officials and other experts to discuss American democracy and some of the challenges it is facing. In previous episodes, we've talked about the decline in civics education, disinformation, and continued controversy over voting reform. Today, we're going to dig a little deeper on the issue of civic engagement. Civic engagement is defined as the act of making a difference in the civic life of one's community. Theoretically, it should bring individuals together. It should strengthen communities. It should make democracy more robust. But what exactly are the boundaries of civic engagement? Is civic engagement still valid when it crosses the boundary into civic unrest and even violence? And what kind of civic engagement will it take to unite us rather than divide us? This series is made possible by a cross-partisan group of organizations, including Freedom House, the National Center for Civil and Human Rights, the George W. Bush Institute, and Issue One. The series also receives underwriter support from the Norman and Karen Willicks Compass Point Group, LLC, and the Transamerica Igon Foundation. Our media partners include Public Broadcasting Atlanta and the Atlanta Press Club. Before we begin our program, a few words of welcome from one of our co-hosts, Jill Sabat, President and CEO of the National Center for Civil and Human Rights. Hello, and welcome to episode six of Reimagining American Democracy. I'm Jill Sabat, the President and CEO of the National Center for Civil and Human Rights in Atlanta. On behalf of the Center and our series co-hosts, Freedom House, Issue One and the George W. Bush Institute, I thank you for joining us today. There are so many ways to engage in our democracy. You can vote, of course, but you can also run for office, work on a campaign. You can volunteer, organize. You can persuade others to see your point of view. A democracy is only as strong as the belief that we can actually make a difference. And so civic engagement, Working to make a difference in the civic life of your community is the topic of our episode today. We are a cross-partisan group of co-hosts and we aim to stimulate a broad conversation that brings together voices from across the political spectrum. We hope you will make your voice heard too. Our hashtag is democracy reimagined. Thanks so much for being here and thank you to our speakers and our moderator, journalist, Jean Meserve. We appreciate all of your work to bring this conversation to life. Over to you, Jean. Thank you, Jill. Today's episode is pre recorded, and we would like you to share your questions and your thoughts on social media using the hashtag democracy reimagined. For our first conversation about civic engagement in America, please join me in welcoming David French, senior editor of The Dispatch, and Hélène Landemore, professor of political science at Yale University. I'd like to discuss today the role civic engagement plays in the health of American democracy and what if any impact, the right kind of civic engagement might have on our current polarization. Alain, in your recent book, Open Democracy, Reinventing Popular Rule for the 21st Century, you offer and explore a new paradigm of democracy in which ordinary citizens are placed at the center of democratic power. First, tell me about the problem you're trying to solve. I'm trying to address the crisis of legitimacy of our democratic institutions and the sense that we are not represented properly by um, the system, elected officials, politicians, generally speaking, and that we're not getting good governance as a result. So what does open democracy look like? Open democracy is basically uh, an ideal of democracy in which citizens have uh, a chance to directly participate in uh, policy making and legislation um, via different mechanisms. And one of them is uh, um, civic lotteries. So you get plucked at random, uh, you know, on the basis of one person, one lottery ticket to spend some time basically making the law for the rest of us. Um, you also have the chance to put things on the agenda through uh, participatory rights like citizens initiatives, uh, 
or uh, recall uh, a policy or a politicians that you don't think is uh, you know, working out, um, things like that. So it's, it's basically um, um, a vision of democracy where the center of power is accessible to all on equal grounds. So how would you relate that to the idea of civic engagement? I would expand that notion for us civic engagement tends to be limited to voting uh, or you know, canvassing or engaging in, in sort of partisan practices on the basis of party identification. And I, I think that's not conducive to authentic deliberation, exchange of arguments uh, with other people, open-mindedness to other people's views, and even encounter with uh, you know, people with opposite views that we tend to demonize, in fact, and ignore. So my vision is um, a lot more about deliberation in common among diversely minded people who come from all walks of life. Um, and so one uh, democratic innovation that I particularly like is called a citizens assembly. It's a large you know, a group of uh, 150 to 500 people that you bring together in a room based on, on uh, random selection and you get them to talk to each other about immigration, about you know, um, climate change, about difficult topics. And you get them to engage across social, political, economic divides. You have a butcher talking to a banker. You have you know, uh, all kinds of people talking together at last. Has this been tried in some places and has it worked? It's been tried in many places. In fact, there are over 400 cases of such mini publics documented around the world. The most famous ones are uh, the Irish citizens assemblies on, uh, gay mar on uh, marriage equality and uh, abortion of recent years, because they've been very successful. They, they concluded with referenda that ended changing the constitution of Ireland. Um, but a uh, uh, semi-successful one recently has been the Citizens Convention for Climate conducted in France and convened by President Macron as a response to the social unrest of the Yellow Vest movement. And uh, I could give you many more examples at the local level, um, you know, national levels. I think it's, it's a quite well uh, established uh, form of uh, citizen participation at this point. So is there a line or are you erasing it between civic engagement and governance? I'm trying to indeed not erase it, but uh, make it more uh, porous, if you will, so that um, we're not contained at the periphery of power, but we really get to go to the center and again, you know, democracy means people's power. What's this power? The power of making the law. But somehow since the 18th century, we've delegated that task to a, a, a cast of professional politicians who stay in power for very long and have lost touch with the rest of us. And I think that we should go back to the original ideal, which was, you know, the ancient Greek ideal of people in charge making the law for themselves. David, let me turn to you and ask you first for your reaction to Hélène's idea. Well, you know, one of the things that I think is an advantage here in the United States of America is we have such, uh, we have a high degree of federalism, an awful lot of different kinds of local governments. And so we have an opportunity to experiment in a lot of different ways. So, for example, we've seen some experimentation in ranked choice voting recently, with some of the results somewhat unclear, although a lot of people would say that one of the reasons why Virginia Governor Glenn Youngkin is, or Governor-elect uh, Glenn Youngkin is now Governor-elect is because of ranked choice voting in the Virginia Republican Convention, which weeded out some more extremist candidates. And so, you know, one of my, one of my postures towards this moment is, let's take advantage of American federalism and American localism to try a lot of different things, <laughs> because we are right now in a position where we have an, extre uh, an increasing amount of extremism amongst those who are politically engaged and an increasing amount of exhaustion with the rest of the public. So what is it that we can do to increase participation amongst those people who currently feel alienated is a matter of really urgent importance for us. And we're gonna to get to that, but before we do, I wanna ask you to react to, to one facet of Elen's work, which essentially would do away with the two-party system. Uh, what would the <laughs> impact be on democracy here in this country? That's a really good question. And as somebody who's been sort of banging the drum for a while on at least a third party, uh, I do think that we have a real need for more coalitional politics in this country. Uh, and 
and rather than binary choice politics. I think the move towards binary choice politics, which has happened for a long time, combined with the increasing extremism of those engaged at the grassroots in that binary choice politics, is creating a real friction point in our democracy. And so I am at this point very interested in having more than the binary choice. And so rupturing the two-party system, uh, I think, is something that needs to be tried. And again, you know, to sort of say, we're going to do this big sweeping national reform to do that, that's pretty much off the table as of right now because of that hammerlock of the two parties. But is there room in individual states and individual localities to rupture that two-party system? I think there is. David, in 2020, you published a book as well, Divided We Fall, America's Secession Threat and How to Restore Our Nation. What's the core argument that you're making? I can sum it up in one sentence, and it's that there is no truly important cultural, political, religious, social force that is pulling Americans together more than it's pushing us apart. That on basically every front of American life, and not just politics, but on almost every front of American life, we are being pulled apart. And this can't keep going on forever without some pretty severe consequences. So is civic engagement one of the ways to address this? Yes, absolutely. But it has to be productive kinds of civil engagement. How do you it's, define that? Yeah, well, one of, the, one of the ways that it can be productive is to make sure that you're, in, you're engaging locally not because of a national grievance, okay? So what we're beginning to see with the nationalization of everything in the United States is that you're beginning to see local energy pouring, say, into a local school board to address problems that don't exist in your local school board. So I'll give you a perfect example of what's happening in my neighborhood. I live in a, a relatively prosperous neighborhood south of Nashville, Tennessee, very, very red. There is no critical race theory here, okay? There's nothing approaching critical race theory here at all, but you have an enormous amount of very angry and agitated parents who've learned, who are learning about this thing called critical race theory and are seeing stories like say from Loudoun County in Virginia or the San Francisco Unified School District who are then hunting to, trying to bring that fight here. And so looking through the textbooks, what have they found? Well, they found books like Ruby Bridges Goes to School about desegregation or Martin Luther King's March on Washington or the Norman Rockwell painting about desegregation. And it said, aha, aha, this is the thing. This we're now we're in the fight. But that's not the fight. That's that's not a fight that should be fought. And it would not be fought, but for the nationalization of our of of our politics. So engaging locally to fight a national fight is the wrong way to engage. So how do you draw the attention back to the local fight? Well, that's a very hard question because the people who are right now, right now we're in a position where we have sort of two broad categories of, um, uh, of Americans. We have a hyper-engaged political wings. It's 20% or less of the American population. And then we have what's called an exhausted majority. The exhausted majority in America are the ones who are much more focused on what is it really going on here? What is it that's really going to focus on my life? But dipping their toes into politics is like, it's like reaching for an electrified fence. They are shocked immediately by the vitriol and recoil from it. And it's not just public figures who receive the hate that we're seeing public figures receive. It's an ordinary person if they, they sort of lift their head above the, the foxhole and say, hey, I think we should maybe calm down a little bit. And then aunts or uncles or old classmates will gang tackle them. And so the engagement in politics has become so thoroughly unpleasant that it's really seeding the field to the people who are most motivated and the people who are most motivated right now are often the most radical. So, Ellen, do you see something short of open democracy that would address some of the problems that the country is experiencing in terms of barriers to civic engagement? Well, yes, because open democracy remains a sort of a ideal, you know, that uh, in practice will have to be hybridized with existing electoral institutions. So I don't envisage, you know, uh, abolishing elected institutions overnight and replacing them with randomly selected chambers. So what can be done? I think what can be done has been done already in certain countries. So for example, in, in the 
uh, German-speaking region of Belgium, uh, they created a council of 24 randomly selected citizens that is institutionalized and given specific powers, in particular the power to set an agenda for the local parliament. So that way you get a deliberative non-partisan, um, you know, diverse body of citizens, not very large, but still, to think about uh, the issues at the local level, exactly like uh, David was saying, and, and then they kind of like constrain the local parliament to take those those ideas into consideration and, and, and deliver. They also have the power to convene other uh, citizens assemblies about specific issues uh, so that you, you spread uh, the burden of thinking about issues and, and, and you, you also um, develop the practice of listening to each other. I think the, the, the problem with the current forms of engagement as, as was just said is that it's, it's alienating. You, you go into that pool and it's unpleasant. It's people screaming at each other, demonizing each other, um, debating, not deliberating, you know, scoring point, posturing, grandstanding. And we need to find a space, a kind of a safe space really where people actually are taken seriously as individuals and not labeled because they come from a certain region or are from a certain party or a certain color or, and, and listened to and taken seriously. I think this would pacify considerably the, the conversation. But Ellen, I'm wondering if in this social media world, you can find that kind of safe space or even a, uh, a diverse group of citizens are going to be subjected to uh, some of the same forces that have divided us more broadly. So they, they, they will, it, you can't erase those forces overnight, but you can design for um, proper deliberation. Again, it's, it's a technology. Deliberation is a technology. We talk about, you know, algorithm and, and things like that, but <laughs> deliberation is a technology we underutilize. Um, and there's been like 40 years of theory and practice of that, of that technology that we need to bring to government, but somehow it's still not completely mainstream. So that's what I want to bring to the table. David, what do you think of that idea? You know, one of the things I think that's really interesting, uh, one of the functioning elements of American democracy right now is the jury, American juries. Now, they're not perfect, right? They're not, no one's going to say that juries get everything right all the time. But as far as a, an element of American participatory, it's not, you know, it, they actually do vote. So there is a sort of a participatory democracy aspect of it. So American juries draw from broad cross sections. Attendance is compulsory unless you can show good cause not to be engaged, and they tend to work. I just wonder when we're talking about participatory democracy, I think there would be a lot of resistance to anything compulsory like jury duty, but if it's not compulsory, then you're going to kind of have the same crowd there, and it's the same sort of people, and the same sort of people who, quite frankly, have become part of the problem. I the, we're right now in this, this world in which when, the, when we do have voting, right, when we do have voting, one of the messages being sent to both the parties is sort of people screaming at the top of their lungs, be more normal, be norm, more normal, please. But then when the election recedes into the rearview mirror, the normal cycle of activism and partisan sniping begins and the parties are pulled towards those edges. But you know the jury system seems to re work relatively well. The actual mass of the electorate when it shows up seems to be sort of screaming at Americans to be more normal, but it's that day-to-day -day churn in our system that is so polarizing and alienating. And that, that's where, you know, what is the answer to that day-to-day -day churn? And what is it? Um. <laughs> Well, you know, for me, you know, there's a couple of things that have to come into play. One is I think we need, we need to be seriously thinking about ways to disrupt that two-party binary. Um, right. that, that's one thing that I think we have to really think structural about that is we have to disrupt that two-party binary. The other thing is we need, leadership really matters. Leadership really matters. And one of the things that the United States of America, if you look back at our history at really critical points in our history, that time and again, we've kind of been real, we've been very fortunate as to who's been in positions of power. When Abraham Lincoln was elected, and when he swore his oath of office in 1861, nobody knew quite what quality of person he would prove to be. And he proved to be, you know, if, if not one of the greatest, if not the greatest president in American history, 
he rose to the occasion. And we right now, we do not have a lot of people rising to many occasions at all. So we have a leadership vacuum. And then, you know, also the other thing is we also have a collective action problem. What we continually see happen is that people, as I said earlier, stick their head above the foxhole, get it chopped down by the rhetorical fire, and then others don't want to speak up. And so we have a, a leadership gap and we have a collective action problem. Again, except in those times when people are voting and there tends to be more of a message, especially in the last couple of years of stop with the extremism, stop with the anger and fury, and then that's quickly forgotten. I have a question for both of you. We all lived through January 6th and the violence that entailed. Does civic engagement always have to be nonviolent? And where are the boundaries? Where are the guardrails? Helene, you want to take that first? Um, I think that in a, in a sort of functional democracy, civic engagement wouldn't have to be violent, but we are at the point where um, it's so dysfunctional that I think for things to change, unfortunately, there needs to be there seem to need to be pressure points. I think, for example, in France, the you know the great national debate, which was an intense moment of deliberation in the country, followed by the Convention for Climate, only happened because of the intense pressure of social movements, the yellow vest, but also the environmental activists. Um, I'm not saying that they were justified in breaking things and threatening you know violence, but the fact is that in practice, it, nothing changes unless there's some kind of a pressure from civil society. I just but there should be some limits on that, I, I of presume. Course, of course. I mean, nobody wants to justify violence. It's just, it's just a sad fact that this seems to be a, uh, a precondition in, in the... In, in Ireland, it didn't go that far. They, they managed to convince the authority that it was a good idea to try these new participatory methods before things got bad. So I think there's also an, an anticipation responsibility on the part of our leaders. And I agree with David about the lack of, of leadership, but I would... I nuance that by saying we should stop to we should stop looking for great men to lead us out of this mess. We we should bank on collective intelligence and um, bottom up processes and deliberative inclusive processes because that's where the, the, I think for me the hope is. Um, and we, if we keep sort of repeating the same pattern over and over again, the 18th century vision of great leadership by great men at the top, I, I don't think that's the way out. David, let me ask you the violence question: Is it a valuable tool? Well, violence does have an impact. It discredits your movement. So, you know, there's a lot of research demonstrating, for example, that violent uh, protest, and in, in especially in the United States, is a great way to drain any public enthusiasm for your position. And, and the great genius, not just the, from a moral standpoint, but also from a pragmatic standpoint, of the, one of the most so important and, and successful social movements in modern American history, was the nonviolent civil rights movement. And that's something that, that it embodied a philosophy of nonviolence. And so you saw this in 2020, 2021, there was a lot of momentum in the United States of America surrounding uh, police reform, for example. And then as violence swept American cities, that, that momentum really began to drain away. It truly began to drain away. And people were very much focused on why are people burning down small businesses? This is not persuading me of anything. This is not persuading me that we need police reform. It's telling me we need more police on the streets. And then after January 6th, there's a reason why the Republican Party is trying to almost pretend like it didn't happen. They don't want any focus on that because if you focus on that, if that's part of our conversation, it drains from the GOP and the Trump movement more broadly, any sort of moral high ground at all. And so one of the things that we're seeing is that radicalism and extremism that is spawning violence quickly discredits those who are violent. It quickly discredits their movement. Even the wave of personal harassment, like does anyone think for five seconds that following Kirsten Cinema into a bathroom to scream at her is gonna change your mind about anything. Harassing Joe Manchin at his home is gonna change his mind about anything. And yet this pervasive atmosphere of harassment and threat is something that is increasingly impacting a number of public voices. It's not changing their minds, it's hardening their attitudes. As somebody who's faced threats and harassment from Trumpist supporters, for example, that does not soften me towards Trumpism. At all, not at all. So violence alienates deeply in addition to 
not being morally justified under its own terms. Elaine, you seem to have a different view on this topic. Do you want to respond to David? No, I, I, I'm aligned. I, I, I just don't think it's true that sometimes it, 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 it constantly backfires. Again, in France, I have this very clear example in mind where I'm not entirely sure President Macron would have gone to such length, put the country on pause for two months if it hadn't been for the, the, the severity of the social movements and protests. And so would it, could we have had the same effects without um, the violence? Possibly, but we've, we've, we're a country with a lot and lots of demonstration. We, we have demonstrations and strikes all the time. Uh, they're, they're rarely as successful. So I, I, it's a, I'm not encouraging, this is not a normative endorsement of any of these. I, I'm completely aligned with David here, but as a, as a scientist, as an observer, I have to admit that in this particular case, it seemed to have had um, an effect that you know, uh, other types of approaches uh, that didn't. So I, if I may also react to another thing, um, the jury example was an, a great example. And the citizens assemblies are in a way a sort of large scale version of that, much more open uh, typically to the larger public than a, a jury is. The self-selection process pr uh, problem that you mentioned is, is, uh, is a problem, but it's um, going to diminish as these uh, forms of civic engagement are more popular, more known, more publicly um, uh, covered, and as we also uh, give incentives, financial incentives to people. So if you, co if you cover people's daycare uh, constraints, if you give them an, uh, an honorarium or a, a payment for the time they spend in those assemblies, they will come. In fact, in the French case, the Citizens Convention, the take-up rate was 60% uh, of people contacted by phone. So you end up getting a, a, a representative sample of the population that's a lot more accurate than the people in elected parliaments. So I, I'm, I think this is the future. Um, David, you talk in your writing about pluralism and mm -hmm. the fact that we no longer tolerate one another's differences in the United States. Can you expand on that idea? Yeah, essentially what we're, we're hap what's happening right now is the fundamental reality of American politics is something called negative partisanship or negative polarization. And that means that our political engagement is less motivated by our affection for our own party or the uh, adherence to our own ideas, but by opposition to the other party and opposition to their ideas. And so it's a, it's a thoroughly oppositional mo movement that is also heavily based not in some sort of intellectual opposition, although that does exist, but to a deeply negative emotional antipathy towards the other side. And so what happens when you have that level and that degree of emotional antipathy is that you begin to lose respect for or lose any desire to protect the liberties of your fellow citizens who disagree with you or the autonomy of their communities. You see a loss for your team anywhere is essentially a loss everywhere. A victory for them anywhere is a victory for them everywhere. And so that very notion that says, wait a minute, this is a diverse society. One side is never going to always triumph for the other. We got to figure out a way to live together. We have a constitutional structure that allows that. Increasingly, at a deep heart level, people are rejecting that because they reject the very idea that these people whom I re who I really, really dislike should be permitted and have the freedom to live out their values and prosper in their own communities. And that is a, that's a heart level change in American politics that is very deeply troubling and animates a lot of the day-to-day -day activism in the United States. And how do we overcome that? <laughs> it's very difficult. I mean, it's something that's been unfolding for 30 to 40 years. Um, the good, you know, the good news is when we talk about people who are really animating this, it's a minority. It's a minority of Americans. A majority of Americans, although they might have some antipathy to the other side, they're also exhausted by the combat. And so we have this thing called an exhausted majority. And so the, but the problem is the, the operative word is exhausted. It needs to be majority. And there is no, I've not seen a great three point plan for activating that majority, unfortunately, because what it's the product of a lot of very deep and profound cultural forces. And Elaine, you talk about cognitive diversity and its importance to democracy. Uh, summarize that for us. So cognitive diversity is a difference in the ways uh, people approach problems, uh, you know, process information, um, 
uh, have information in the first place because of the position they occupy in the world, the gender they have, the, 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 the race they uh, identify with, et cetera, et cetera. And so when you have a, a parliament in, um, that is, uh, you know, let's say mostly male, mostly white, mostly educated, mostly wealthy, they will uh, suffer from a lack of cognitive diversity as a result because they won't have access to a number of lived experiences, as we say, uh, perspectives, points of view, etc. That would be very helpful in uh, designing solutions to social problems. So that's, uh, in my work, that's what I focus on. How do we bring cognitive diversity to uh, the, the process of making laws and policies? Because it turns out that it's, it's a key um, input in this, you know, in the emergence of collective intelligence. Um, one, one thing I want to say, if you, if you allow me, is that we've been focusing on the political dimension of all this, and we're like, well, how about more civic engagement? I think a big problem is the economic dimension of the crisis we're in, because if you look at uh, graphs that you know, uh, relate uh, economic inequalities and polarization, it's a straight correlation. Uh, basically, over the 30, last 30 years, 40 years, Neoliberal policies of, of, and globalization and technology and all other factors have led to massive, massive social and economic inequalities. They cause a lot of polarization, you know. So I think that that's um, that's another dimension. If we reduce economic inequalities, if we if we lived in a more solidari solidarity solidarity um, economy uh, and took took care of of uh, you know the people at the bottom, I think things would get better. David, we're, we're low on time, but I want to ask you, a previous episode we did had to do with the decline in civic education. Do you think that is having an impact on civic engagement? Oh, I think the decline in civic education ha is having some really profound impacts. Um, it's not just that we don't, we're learning many of the wrong things and we're not learning the right things. So people don't understand how our government truly is structured and how bills become laws, but they're intimately familiar with the latest outrageous tweet from a member of Congress from the other side. And so we're m majoring in the minors, we're minoring in the majors. And then as a result, what we have is an enormous amount of polarization, but not a lot of constructive, no constructive way of understanding how the system works. I really want to get to solutions here, and I'm wondering if either of you can give me some concrete examples of the kind of civic engagement that is actually helping conquer our divisions. Elaine, you want to go first? And again, we're low on time. Yes, and I have to start with expressing my disagreement. I think civic education is not the issue. There's absolutely no evidence that civic education improves anything. Uh, in fact, there's been multiple attempts at increasing education. The, the, I really think this is a, a, a symptom rather than a cause of the issues we have. I would look to political and economic uh, fundamentals instead. Um, so, so, so could you repeat the last question? I'm sorry. I, uh, uh, yeah, some examples of some civic engagement that actually are succeeding in, in healing some of our divisions. Again, I'm going to point out to the, to the things that I, I know best and that actually work. Uh, citizens' assemblies bring people from all venues together. You create common ground, you create a sense of, of respect, um, of solidarity, and the potential for actual authentic deliberation, which is a very powerful technology to deliver good, good laws and therefore good governance. David, your thoughts? Yeah, let's leave politics for a moment. I don't know if you saw this tremendous story of dads on duty yes. in, a, in, a, in a high school that was having a ton of problems with fighting, a ton of problems with, uh, you know, this, with violence on the campus. And what happened? Dads stepped up and they went into the hallways of the school and transformed the culture. That is the kind of thing where individuals, not waiting on a political party to move, not waiting on an agency of the state to move, but acting as, as parents who love their kids stepped up, did something constructive. And it's one of the more inspiring stories. And now there, there's talk of chapters of that springing up in other parts of the country. It's that loving engagement of people in their own community, not because of politics, but because they love their own kids. That is, that is the, exactly the kind of thing that gives me hope. And we'll have to leave it there. Thank you, Alain Lendemore and David French. We'll be back in just a moment with our second panel. And we are back with our second conversation, The Art of Organizing. We are joined by Congressman Joe Kennedy, who founded and now leads the organization, The Groundwork Project. 
Joe Kennedy, thanks a lot for joining us today to share your thoughts on civic engagement. So you were a member of Congress and obviously were deeply involved in the democratic process. You are no longer in Congress and I'm wondering what civic engagement looks like to you now. Um, first off, thanks so much for having me. Uh, lots of that process are, um, I think is, is the same, right? The fundamentals are the same, but let's be clear that the, the objectives on this to some extent uh, have changed. I mean, the, the overall, when I think of civic engagement, I think of a collection of community members coming together to try to address a common problem or, or push for a common solution. And that is the core aspect of democracy, representative democracy. It's a core aspect of how a citizenry pushes their elected officials and, and, and uh, to take out a position or to, or to push a solution or to tackle a problem. And by the way, it's the way in which a member of Congress, particularly in the House of Representatives, is able to garner a collection of colleagues that is needed in order to pass a bill, right? But it's still that, that citizenry, perhaps instead of being 750,000 constituents, it's 435 fellow voting members of the House of Representatives that you still need to get 218 on board um, to pass the bill, right? And so the principles of this stay the same. What I think has changed a bit is, for me, uh, understanding as an elected official that you are uh, in constant dialogue, back and forth with the communities that you represent, um, trying to do your best to, to listen, to lead, to respond, to understand, and then to take the issues that are um, being brought to the fore and translate those into solutions and then get enough of your colleagues on board to, to be able to deliver on them. And I very much often felt like you were in the middle of that process trying to, to absorb and lead and then build a, a coalition within the body to be able to deliver on the solutions. And the system is structured so that actually delivering on the solutions, unfortunately, is incredibly hard to do. Uh, and translating that frustration back and forth was, was something that needed to be done as well. So you're currently engaged in community organizing, and I'm wondering how you differentiate, if you differentiate, between community organizing and civic engagement. Uh, yes, I do, because I think civic engagement is, can be done without that organizing part, right? There, there's obviously a spectrum here about what it means to be civically engaged and whether that's somebody that's going up to town hall meetings or, or writing into your elected official or calling your member of Congress or making sure you're out there voting. All of those ways are, are engaging civically. Community organizing means you are pulling together or part of an entity that is literally um, bringing uh, citizens throughout a community together to try to address a, a common issue. And so I, I think they're related, but they are distinct. And what is so critical at this moment in a time of political uh, polarization and extraordinary partisanship is that I believe the way we get through this is you have a, a government that is more responsive to people's needs that can uh, is able to explain what well, either deliver on uh, on the challenges that we're con confronting or explain why we can but there has to be that constant dialogue a constant uh, appreciation for the fact that even if you're not able to deliver that you're trying and a definition of um, the, the roadblocks or the structural frictions within our society that are preventing those solutions from coming, uh, from taking hold. And that is where community organizing is so critical because um, that dialogue back and forth as an elected official, I needed those organizations to be able to have that conversation with me so that the word got back out to the people I was representing. So how would you differentiate between the role of community organizers and elected officials? So they are on the one hand, obviously aligned when they are aligned, right? So if I had a community in Brookline, Massachusetts that defined some of the biggest challenges as an economy that works for everybody, climate change um, and a, a, a responsible kind of economic spending, something like that, right? If those are aspects of, of my own agenda, then great, we're aligned. If you end up having constituencies that say, hey, we're aligned on that, but we're, we think your priority three should be priority one, there's gonna be a, a conversation and a push and pull, and that's fine, right? That's part of a healthy democracy. What my job as an elected official was to do was to stay in constant contact with those organizations, listen to their concerns, try to champion them where I could, and explain either why my position differed from them or why my prior, excuse me, prioritization differed from them. And then in that constant dialogue back and forth, the role of those organizations, right, of the community organizers 
was to push their elected officials, whether it be it um, city councilors, mayors, members of Congress, Senate, and the presidency, and coming together uh, around forming those coalitions that can start small and then get quite large to be able to exert that pressure to know that one, if you're, if you're with us, we'll provide you uh, the cover and the backup and the support that you need in order to, to go out and take a, uh, a leading position. And if you don't, we're also gonna hold you accountable uh, because we've got people here who have made clear that this is a major challenge for them and a, and a priority for them. And if you're gonna disappoint them, then you're gonna be held to account, which again, that's the definition of the job. So Barack Obama famously was a community organizer who eventually became president. Did Democrats own the space or do you see weaknesses in the democratic approach to community organizing? Democrats definitely do not own the space. And I think there's a number of challenges here, some structural, um, some definitional and some just political, right? And, and perhaps I would argue, not to say everyone else would, but much of what we have seen transpire over the course of the past several elections, again, I would argue, is Democrats offering hope, famously Barack Obama offering uh, hope and change, and Republicans offering essentially fear. Um, but fear is a profound motivator, and hope is harder to organize around. Um, many people, um, and there's plenty of data that bears this out, the risk of losing something, they will um, retain, they will value higher than their, the benefit of adding some other additional benefit or some solution. And so that fear of change, that fear of loss is a, a greater motivating factor than the hope of being able to tackle some challenge. And I think writ large, you're seeing Democrats still campaign on hope and conservatives largely still campaign on fear. And that, that is a, a political, I think, disadvantage one. Second, Democrats need to and, and just haven't. You cannot be a party that, that broadcasts inclusivity, that says, we see you, we hear you, wherever you are, whoever you are, race, color, creed, ethnicity, national origin, whatever it is, you count. We, we want you part of the, our team. And then not show up in every part of this country. <laughs> and Democrats for a long time have written off huge swaths uh, of the United States, particularly at a federal level. You don't see national Democrats campaigning in places like uh, Appalachia, and the Plains, and the Deep South where we need to. And if you're gonna cede that, that territory, you're gonna cede that communication, you're gonna make it so that, as a friend of mine who was running for uh, Senate in Texas said uh, several years ago, Beto O'Rourke, when he was running across Texas, said he'd go to some small towns and they said, we haven't seen a Democrat campaign here since LBJ, <laughs> right? Some 50 or 60 years before. That is a massive detriment that Democrats have to try to uh, overcome. And so, you, you got to engage and you got to be everywhere and we haven't been. So you're focusing on some of those unwinnable regions for the Democrats with your new groundwork project. Um, is it an effort to address this very problem? It's an effort to, in part, yes, but it's an observation, Gene, one that, look, I believe in a country and in a party that says everybody counts. And I believe in a process where you say, okay, well, if you believe everybody counts, then you got to go out and listen to people, right? Like that's, the first principle of community organizing, right? The, the two biggest parts to it is you gotta have a messenger that has credibility in the community. So dropping somebody down that isn't from the community, doesn't know anybody there, might have written their last white paper, might be academically correct, but nobody knows. They're not gonna have any ability to deliver a solution there because you can't pull people together. You gotta to earn that trust and respect. And so somebody with credibility is critical. And then you gotta go and listen. And when people say, hey, this is how we interpret the challenges confronting us, even if they happen to be off the mark a bit, you got to go through that process, again, to earn that credibility and to make sure that you're getting the buy-in that you need in order to deliver that solution. And so from Groundworks projects, it really is supporting hyper-local organizers in places that often get, um, don't get the attention that is needed or necessary from a Democratic Party, because we believe those organizers are the ones with credibility, are the ones closest to the ground, are the ones that know what the problems are and the solutions are, but often can't get the, the support or have their voices um, raised and amplified so that they can get access to the resources that they need in order to, to chart that course. And so, we're really so trying to help them. You're, under, you're supporting local leaders, but yes. you're doing the supporting. And I'm wondering if you get pushback, if you face hostility, because you know, you're from the Northeast. Oh my gosh, Massachusetts, no less. And you're a Kennedy. 
what are you doing here in our neighborhood? So I think without question, yes, we have and we will. And, and that's okay. That's part of the process. My, my job in that is to hear people out and say, look, I am not, as part of our process right, with our partners, is not to come in and say, hey, let me tell you what you're doing wrong, or let me tell you how we think we should do it better. It's to say, we'll come into a community and say, tell us, tell us what you think your challenges are. What are you trying to do? And what is it that you need in order to be successful? And then can we provide any resources to help you be successful? And some places, sometimes we can't, right? If, if you're asking us to you know, drop down hundreds of millions of dollars or you know, reverse the rotation of the moon, like we can't do that. If you're saying, hey, we would really love some potential connections with certain people. We'd really love thoughts about how to shape this problem. We'd really love uh, an introduction to somebody. We'd really love to be able to make this connection to this organization or bounce some ideas off you. We can, we can do that. And so it's being, I think, humble enough to know that we don't have the answers to every challenge. Um, critical enough thinkers to know that there's folks on the ground that, that probably do. You're going to go in and you're going to listen and you're going to ask that question of how can we help and be honest about what you can do. Because if you overpromise and underdeliver, you're toast. Uh, are, so are you, are you dealing are you dealing with certain specific issues? Are there certain kinds of campaigns that you're supporting? Well, it's not so much the campaigns, Gene. It, it's the people, right? It's recognizing that in some of these places in the Deep South, in Appalachia, in, um, in many parts of the Plains, where Democrats haven't had a presence, haven't campaigned, they haven't, the investment, whether it's dollars or resources or individuals or volunteer hours, they haven't come in. How can you possibly expect somebody to cast their vote for you when they've never heard somebody come in and actually tell you what they stand for or let alone spend a minute of time with you, right? And that's what we're trying to do is say, listen, we believe, I believe, we believe, Groundwork believes that the, there are challenges, or there are solutions to these challenges, but those solutions, many of them are gonna to have to come with political power. And that the extent that some of these, that some of these challenges are reinforced by a lack of political power, that power is not going to be seated. That power has to be earned and has to be taken back. And the only way you do that is by organizing, right? Organizing builds infrastructure and infrastructure builds power. And what we're trying to do is say, I can't tell you Right, what the biggest issue is in pick a town in some part of the deep south. But I can tell you that there are people down there that are working on it. And we wanna spend some time to try to figure out who those individuals are and do what we can to support them. But you are supporting progressive issues. And I'm wondering if by doing so, you are increasing the political polarization in the country. So I uh, would emphatically disagree, probably not surprisingly. Um, I think in large part, what the polarization is driven by, and, and from my years in Congress, um, I saw this literally because it, 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 it did get worse, I think, since I was there, was you have a Republican Party that says, if you don't vote for Republican, Democrats are going to destroy your community, your country, and, and our world, right? And so they run off of a, a fear-based campaign, promise a whole bunch of things like the repeal of the Affordable Care Act, can't deliver it, and then blame Democrats when you can't deliver it, right? When it was, again... Republicans that famously voted against their own, their own bill. But it is always the other. You see Democrats that then have said, hey, we want to be able to deliver on A, B, and C, but for a lot of reasons, we can't, whether it's challenges, political challenges sometimes within our party or structural barriers that prevent um, some of those solutions. And so the solution that both parties have engaged in is upping the rhetoric and the vilification of the other side to blame their inability to deliver on that change. And what I'm saying is, the way you deliver on that change is you get a more responsive political system. And the way you do that is you build up the infrastructure. But in your remarks here, you've said that the Republicans run on fear. You've said it twice as a matter of fact. So isn't that in fact fueling this splintering of the American public? No, Gina, I don't, I, I take your point. I again would disagree because regardless as to the position that a Republican individual Republican candidate or party will take, right? And look, we will disagree on aspects of healthcare or climate or the economy, fine, right? What the appropriate tax rate is, fine. You wanna run a campaign based on that, also fine. But let's also address the, the consequence that was played out in the, some of these uh, pages of the Washington Post just last week, where 
there is raw sewage sitting on lawns of families in Jackson, Mississippi, the state capital. And Jackson doesn't have the money to be able to get rid of the sewage. And who does? The state house. But the concern is that the state house, which is run by Republicans, many of the municipal municipalities in Mississippi are actually run by Democrats, will not allow the disbursement of the funds in order to actually address it because they're saying that's the, the city's responsibility. The city doesn't have the money and the, the decision to not do anything about it means raw sewage continues on people's lawns. That is an untenable solution, right? And that's not a hope versus fear conversation. That's a, hey, let's get state government to work with the municipality to actually force this change. But you've got a state government that's still, according to quotes in that story, has a lieutenant governor that's saying, too bad. So what lessons can you take from the Groundwork Project that could be more broadly applied to perhaps uh, develop a national civic engagement? The, the solutions that I think we as a country are looking for are being uh, incubated in communities across our country. That, it's not that we don't have solutions to many of these challenges. It's we confront structural barriers to make sure that there is in fact access to political power to deliver on those solutions at a policy level. And what I am betting, uh, Gene, based off of my near decade in Congress, is that one of the biggest challenges we confront is that calcification of um, really tension and that power dynamic uh, calcified within our political structures, that that's what needs to, to, um, to essentially be changed that that's what needs to be eased so that you have a government that is more responsive to the needs and the will of its people. And if you do, even if a pendulum swings back and forth, which it, it will, right? I'm not saying Republicans should, aren't necessarily, are gonna ever win a, a race for the House, Senate, presidency, mayor's race or whatever else. And there's communities across our country, obviously where, where that's gonna be the case and that's fine. What I am saying is the political structures of our society should not be based off of the disenfranchisement, strategic disenfranchisement uh, of certain groups and communities that then lead to a political outcome, that lead to a policy outcome that is not actually in the further best service of our country. And what Groundwork is trying to do is to build up that organizing capacity and infrastructure to be able to have a more responsive political system. So would you have a message for people on the other side of the aisle who want to have their voices heard? Yeah, engage, right? Absolutely. But, and there's no, there is no, I would wholeheartedly endorse and suggest that they do the same thing. But let's be clear that that engagement can't be through championing of voter fraud laws that are based off of the fact that the president, former president of the United States won an election which he did not win. That engagement can't be based off of the fact that. Um, climate change is not real, when in fact it is. That engagement can be based off of a narrative that is skewed to a policy outcome that is not reflected by actual facts and reality. And as long as it is, sure, I will come down on uh, various positions that are different than some of my colleagues. That's fine, welcome to democracy. There should be debate, there should be disagreement. That's literally the entire point. The part that I'm fighting against is just the exploitation of legacy political structures that have been put in place to benefit the few at the expense of everybody else. And take those down, run a fair race and run a fair fight and we'll see where the chips land. And that's fine. That's all I think I'm asking for. And it's all anybody should be asking for in the United States. What would you say are the key ingredients of a successful civic campaign? And does it boil down to some degree to leadership, to who's steering the ship? A lot of it obviously comes to, to leadership, but I, I wouldn't say it all comes to leadership. Look, we've seen, I've seen campaigns where a great candidate falls short. I've seen campaigns where a not so great candidate wins. Um, and a lot of that comes from the infrastructure that comes underneath him or her. Because if you have a really great dedicated team of campaign organizers that themselves are able to go out in communities, uh, listen to people, inspire them, get those communities engaged and be able to create a sense of ownership of the outcome about what will happen if people engage in that system. That is, that's what politics is all about. And yes, it obviously helps if you've got somebody the caliber of President Obama leading the way on that or Senator Warnock leading the way on that, that's great. 
but it doesn't always, it doesn't mean that it has to always come from the principal. It can certainly come from some fantastic community organizers. And that's been part of the, the real joy of this work since I left office is being able to spend more time with some of those folks in Massachusetts and around the country that Jean quite candidly will just knock your socks off about how they are spending time, the time that they spend in their communities, the uh, ingenuity that they show and, and being able to pull people together the way they can, uh, extraordinary listening, listening skills and the ability to, to find a common narrative that, that inspires a community to take on these big challenges and, and literally provide hope in places that oftentimes get overlooked. In the current environment, what would it take to foster the kind of civic engagement that you're talking about that would help bridge this gulf uh, that we see within the American electorate? I think one of the biggest pieces to this, right, is a common set of facts, which at this point is getting harder and harder, right? As you you push me on saying, hey, you're using rhetoric that, that perhaps, you know, some another side here, conservatives might find objectionable, fair point, let's get to a point where we are creating arguments off of a, a agreed upon set of facts and we will have that debate, right? And that's, I think our country is strongest when you've got two uh, or more healthy political parties in this system because it gives people a choice. And again, that choice is critical in a democracy where we shouldn't be a place where there isn't one. But you can't, that entire structure of that debate comes off kilter when for the political outcome, for the benefit of a political outcome, a political party is essentially throwing facts um, to the wind and saying it doesn't matter because we want, we need this narrative. Um, and so obviously a common set of facts is critical. Second is you need community organizers that are willing to put in the time. And as I, you've heard me say, it's amazing work. It's um, inspiring work. It is long, hard work. It is community meetings, hour after hour. It is listening to people um, talk about their challenges and um, you know, voice their concerns. And some of those meetings can be long and they can be intense and they can be um, inspiring. They can also be boring, right? But going, there's no shortcuts in this. And that is the one piece I think often gets overlooked is democracy, a healthy and functioning one. It, that is an achievement. That isn't something that just happens. That happens because citizens decide to take a, an element of their time, which they don't have a lot of, and give it back into their community for an overall community benefit. And so that's also on us. You can't be looking at somebody else to solve these challenges. It says, okay, well, maybe I should go to a local town meeting every now and again, or you know, the school board meeting or whatever else, and, and just get some ideas to what's going on because your voice matters in this. Even if you think it doesn't, it does. We'll have to leave it there. Joe Kennedy, thank you so much for joining us. That concludes today's episode on reviving civic engagement. I want to thank you all for participating. I also want to thank this series co-hosts, underwriters, and media partners for making this program possible. Our next and final episode will be Democracy in America, Democracy in the World. It is going to air on December 16th. Once again, this series is free. This series is open to the public. Our hashtag is hashtag democracy reimagined, and you can learn more or register attend at reimaginingdemocracy.org. I'm Jean Mazur. We'll see you next time.